And the title of our text this morning is, It is Finished. It is Finished. We're part two. And our text is John chapter 19, verses 17 through 30. And John chapter 19, verses 17 through 30, as we come again to consider the events and the circumstances attending the burial or the brutal crucifixion and the victorious death, the burial of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we consider those events, we consider those circumstances recorded by the Apostle John in the historical narrative here, we're also attempting as we go uh, a careful consideration of their theological significance We have the narrative in verses 17 through 30. This narrative is expounding for us great, profound, central, apex level theological truths associated here with the central focus of the Christian faith, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I refer to it as an attempt to carefully consider their theological significance because we're treading on holy ground here as we go. Um, That holy ground at the very center of our faith. And no no matter what attempt we make, no matter how thorough the pulpit or how engaged the pew. Um, The preaching of the cross will stretch into eternity, and here we feel as though we're just scratching the surface. We feel weak and inadequate uh, to these things, and uh, words fail us. So, with the Lord's help, and we need the Lord's help, I pray we're making a faithful attempt here. And I pray he'd be blessed to, or pleased to bless our efforts with much fruit, Uh, for his glory and for our eternal good. So, at the very center of our faith is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, Paul says, we preach Christ, what? Crucified. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So necessary to our redemption, necessary to our right standing with God, necessary to forgiveness, necessary to pardon, necessary to justification, necessary to adoption, necessary to sanctification, necessary to our ultimate and eventual glorification, necessary to the demands of God's holiness, necessary to the demands of his perfect justice, Necessary to the free offer of grace. Necessary to the free offer of his mercy, his love in the gospel, is the sacrificial and substitutionary death of the only begotten Son of God. 1 John chapter 4 verse 9, John says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world to die, that we might live through him. The preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the good news, is the preaching of Christ crucified. Paul again in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. Paul says, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The death of Christ... The cross of Christ, the suffering of Christ, has been decreed by God in eternity past according to the scriptures. His death, these events that we look at, that we talk about, that we examine in John chapter 19 verses 17 through 30, these events, all that take place here in the historical narrative are according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. The Lord Jesus Christ is the the promised seed of Genesis chapter 3 that would crush the serpent's head. And here as we look at our text, John chapter 19, we also see the foretold bruising of his heel. 700 years prior to the cross, speaking in the prophetic past tense, the foretold events so certain they're spoken of as already completed, The prophet Isaiah said, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. 
The Lord Jesus knew all along exactly what would come to pass. He knew all along that he came into the world for the purpose of suffering and dying. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 32, he took the 12 aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles and they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. It was said that the, the disciples didn't understand these sayings, that the truth of these sayings were hidden from them. And we come to see on this side of the cross how clearly the Lord proclaimed his coming death. He was eyes forward facing the cross. Jesus again in Mark chapter 10 verse 45. The Son of Man did not come to serve, to be served, But the Son of Man came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. All of this was according to the Scriptures. According to the Old Testament, the Old Testament pointing pointing forward to the death of Christ, the cross of Christ, even the words of our Lord, the gospel records, pointing forward to his destiny with the cross. So as we consider then the theological significance of the events and the circumstances recorded in the historical narrative of our text, we're also to see these profound biblical theological truths. The truthfulness, think with me, right? The truthfulness, the faithfulness, and the veracity of God's word, the Holy Scriptures. We're to understand from these things, this is God's book. This is God's plan. These are God's decrees. This is God's holy word, and everything that God has said will come to pass. The truthfulness, the faithfulness, the veracity of God's word. Jesus Christ did come into the world to save sinners. Jesus Christ did live a perfect life. Jesus Christ suffered and died. The sacrificial lamb of God in substitution for sinners, his own, whom he would come to save. We're here to see in this text the depravity of man, the wickedness of this world, the sin which was born for his own in his body on the tree. We're to see the holiness of God, the justice of God, the judgment of God, the wrath of God. We're to see the infinite and boundless love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God. The cross is where, as it is said, justice and mercy kiss. We're to see the glory and the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. Holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, who has now become higher than the heavens, crowned with glory and honor. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. Now, our historical setting, which we want to remind ourselves of in our text, the historical setting has been developed for us with three perspectives, or from the basis of the perspective of three primary locations, Gethsemane, Gabbatha, and Golgotha. Think about them in terms of the three Gs, Gethsemane, Gabbatha, and Golgotha. In Gethsemane, we see the Lord... Acknowledging in Matthew chapter 26 that his soul was exceedingly sorrowful. Sorrowful even to the point of death. And the Lord here is facing a death that no Christian martyr has ever faced. It's different here. And why? Because he faces the cup. The dreadful cup of the wine of the fierceness of the wrath of God. That wrath poured out full strength into the cup of God's indignation against sin. So the Lord in Gethsemane agonizes in prayer to the Father. The sweat of his brow mingled with blood as he confronts the suffering and death that awaits him at the cross. And submitting himself perfectly to the will of the Father in love, the Lord is betrayed into the hands of sinners. He's arrested, he's bound, led away, delivered over, awaiting the cross. The mockeries of justice known as the ecclesiastical trial And the civil trial of the Lord Jesus Christ ends at Gabbatha. Gabbatha was the name for the pavement outside of Pilate's praetorium, where Pilate would address the crowd from the judgment seat. The Jews are there on the pavement at Gabbatha, stirring up the gathering crowd. They're whipped into a maddened frenzy, and they cry out for blood, crucify him. A Pilate finds no fault in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is innocent of the charges that they claim against him. 
And Jesus, as a lamb before its shears, is silent. He opens not his mouth to defend himself. He opens not his mouth to revile in return. And a corrupt and cowardly Pilate delivers him over to be scourged. And finally to be crucified. And so we come again today then to the place of execution, the place of the skull, or Golgotha. In verse 17, our text reads, And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. The last Lord's Day, we had determined to work through the text, our text, under five headings. And considering the the Lord's own victory cry in verse 30, it is finished, our five headings are these. One, it is finished at the cross. Two, it is accomplished by the king. Three, it is affirmed by the word. Four, it is motivated by love. And five, it is proclaimed in victory. And you'll find those on your notes in the bulletin. Now last week, we looked at the setting of the cross under point one. It is finished at the cross. This week, we begin with point two on your notes. It is accomplished by the king. It is accomplished by the king. We see this in verse 19. Read with me. Verse 19. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. And Roman crucifixions at the time, it was common, it was customary for a notice of charge or an inscription to be written on a placard and draped around the neck of the offender as they carried the cross beam of their cross to the place of execution, where that placard would then be nailed to the cross above the head of the criminal as a public display of the crimes, the charges against them. The crucifixion was a public display. It was meant to be a public warning. And this charge, this inscription nailed to their cross was meant to be a deterrent. Don't follow in this path. Don't commit this same crime. The inscription would traditionally include the criminal's name and their crime, as we see here now in verse 19. So in verse 19, it says here that Pilate himself chooses the words, and Pilate himself writes the inscriptions. There's a reason for that. This is the final antagonistic, insulting jab aimed at the Jews. And Pilate wanted to, wanted to write this himself. He wrote... Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. That's interesting here. All four gospel writers make it a point to record the inscription. And so we want to take some time and unpack the importance of this under three headings. Considering the the inscription, verses 19 to 22, we'll see the title of the king. We'll discuss the scope of his kingdom. And lastly, the implications of his kingship. The title of the king, the scope of his kingdom, And the implications of his kingship. First, the title of the king. Matthew calls it an accusation. Mark and Luke call it an inscription. Here in verse 19, John refers to it as a royal title. Jesus of Nazareth is the royal son of God. He is the king of the Jews. A pilot, it was simply a charge. It was a way to continue his prideful sparring with the Jewish leaders whom he despised. And so it was a way to get back at them, a way to poke them. But both Pilate and the Jews refused to acknowledge the significance here of what Pilate has written on the placard. The Jews actually considered Jesus being from Nazareth as evidence that he was not the Messiah. Matthew tells us that being from Nazareth is actually the evidence that he is the Messiah. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, Joseph, being warned by God in a dream to stay away from Judea, this was after the event of Herod, right, seeking the life of all sons, all male children in Bethlehem under two years old. Joseph, being warned by God to stay away from Judea, says there in Matthew 2, 23, that he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth. 
so that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, the term Nazarene was considered an insult. Right? The Jews used it as an insult. The people viewed it as an insult. It was a term of derision. Nazareth had come to be considered a disreputable place, a rough place. People might use derisive terms like hillbilly. <laughs> or when they say here, you know, we're from the sticks, that's often not a, not a good thing. <laughs> it's usually a term of derision uh, or a term of insult. The term used here, Nazarene, was often used for people who were rough around the edges, someone who was rude, someone who was crude. That's why Nathaniel asked Philip in John chapter 1, verse 46, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? It was shocking to Nathaniel that the Messiah could possibly come from Nazareth. So not only does the title of John, or the title of John chapter 19, verse 19, in reference to the fulfillment of that which was spoken by the prophets in Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, but it also points to the reproach that the Lord Jesus Christ would suffer at the hands of sinners. The reproach of this world that he would be born the Son of God and from Nazareth. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3. He is despised and rejected by men. He was despised, we did not esteem him. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 7. He is despised by man abhorred by the nation, this Nazarene, right? Psalm chapter 22, verse 6, he is a reproach of men, despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me, the psalmist says. They shoot out the lip. They shake their head. So we have the name, Jesus of Nazareth. Next we see the charge or the accusation that was written. Jesus of Nazareth was the king of the Jews, as we saw, we remember from John chapter 18, verse 33, the original charge that was brought to Pilate was essentially sedition. It was a charge that Jesus Christ claimed to be a king. Now remember, as the Jews were coming to Pilate, they're rattling off charges left and right, right? To get Pilate to approve the death penalty. They wanted Pilate to approve their plot to put Jesus to death. At first, he was simply an evildoer, right? If, we, if he weren't an evildoer, we would not have brought him to you. After that, he was perverting the nation, leading them astray. He was preventing people from paying taxes, right? All these charges that were hurled up before Pilate. However, Pilate, in his questioning of the Lord Jesus Christ, quickly dispelled any notion that Jesus was any kind of seditious threat. And he determined that Jesus was innocent of these charges. Finally... They informed Pilate, in John chapter 19, verse 7, they informed Pilate of their own death penalty charge against him. They said that he made himself the Son of God. Now, making himself the Son of God, in their eyes, made the Lord Jesus Christ a blasphemer. As we know from John, the Jews felt that making himself the Son of God made himself equal with God. And so according to their law, according to Leviticus... The Jews said that he ought to die for blasphemy. And what they wanted written above his head was that charge. They wanted blasphemer. Jesus of Nazareth, a blasphemer. But unbeknownst to Pilate, unbeknownst to the Jews, what they get is the truth. What they get is the truth written on the placard above his head. Jesus Christ is King of kings. He is Lord of lords to the glory of God the Father. And so Pilate takes his last opportunity then, before the crucifixion and death of the Lord Jesus Christ, he takes his last opportunity to insult the Jews, and he writes the title, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And he strings it out above his head in three languages. Verse 20. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And we looked at the title of the king. Consider with me now the scope of his kingdom. John says in verse 20, the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. Now likely the place where he was crucified, near a roadway, a common roadway in and out of the city of Jerusalem. The crucifixion was meant to be, again, a public spectacle. So you have a large Passover crowd coming in and out of the city, many of them coming in and out through this gate, this roadway, in and out of the city of Jerusalem. They would have made their way along that roadway. And so the title, as John alludes to in verse 20, would have been clearly visible to anybody walking in or walking out. 
And John says in verse 20 that many then of the Jews read this title. The title was written in Hebrew or here Aramaic. The language of Judaism was the language of many ethnic Jews. Pilate wrote it in Greek, the language of the Roman provinces to the east of Judea. A common language spoken by most everyone in that area at that time. And then he wrote the title in Latin, the official language of the Roman Empire or the language of the army. Far beyond the intentions of Pilate in writing the title, he gets far more than he bargains for. Pilate essentially announces to the known world of that time that Jesus Christ is the king. Whether you spoke Hebrew, Greek, or Latin, to any one of that Passover crowd coming into the city or out of the city of Jerusalem, this was a picture here of the universal offer of the gospel to Jews and to Gentiles, to Jews or Greeks, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. Right, Psalm 96.10, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Here, Pilate, with his inscription, says among the nations, Jesus of Nazareth is the king of the Jews. It's a beautiful demonstration of the universal offer of the gospel. What's also interesting here to consider, a beautiful demonstration of this is the conversion of two sinners at the cross that we see in Scripture. One, we looked at last week, the conversion of the Jewish zealot that hangs on a cross next to the Lord Jesus Christ. And his miraculous conversion, the Lord granting to him repentance and faith. And then you have with the thief on the cross... We also see, and we'll talk about next week, the likely conversion of a Roman centurion standing nearby who witnessed the crucifixion. Having seen the work of God, the miraculous events that attended the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then having seen the person, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, even in his crucifixion, this Roman centurion was gloriously converted. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record that the Roman centurion upon Jesus Christ breathing breathing his last said, truly this man was the son of God. Luke adds that the centurion, this Roman, glorified God and attested to the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. The scope of his kingdom, right? The title of the king, the scope of his kingdom. Lastly, the implications of his kingship. The implications of his kingship. Look with with me at verse 21. Therefore, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered them in verse 22, What I have written, I have written. Now the Jews, all of this was abhorrent to the Jews. They, of course, despised the notion of Jesus as their king. And they despised and resented Pilate's ridicule. And so we're not surprised in verse 21 to see the chief priests, upon seeing the placard that Pilate had written, immediately going to Pilate, wanting it changed. Right? They use the imperatives in verse 21. This is no request. This is the demand. They're demanding that the sign be changed. They say, imperative, do not write the king of the Jews, but write instead, write instead, he said, I am the king of the Jews. In other words, they want the sign to appear as a claim of the Lord Jesus Christ and not as a title. This title was obviously meant by Pilate to mock the Jews, and they felt the brunt of that mockery. They didn't want the the sign, in essence, pointing at them, They wanted the sign pointing at what they believed was a false claim of Jesus Christ. So Pilate answers in verse 22. He answers in verse 22 with two perfect tense verbs. In other words, it's completed. Two perfect tense verbs back to back signify absolute finality. What I have written, I have written. I'm not changing it. It's done. Now, we'll talk about the use of perfect tense when we get to the Lord's statement in verse 30, that it is finished. The Lord uses that same tense in his statement. Now, whether the Jews like it or not, whether the Jews like it or not, what I have written, Pilate says, I have written. He is their king. 
Whether the Jews acknowledge it or not, he is their king. Whether they submit to him or not, he is the promised Davidic king. He is the Messiah. He will rule upon the throne of David forever and ever, whether the Jews like it or not. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end, whether the Jews like it or not. Luke chapter 1, verse 33 He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. And again, one of the things that we're looking at as we walk through the text is how these events, these circumstances that are recorded here by the gospel writers, having taken place around the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. These events were foretold in Scripture. The Lord Jesus Christ foretold in Scripture God's Word affirming Jesus Christ as the promised King, as the promised Messiah. We see an example of this in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Verse 6. Again, think with me. These words written 700 years before Christ. It's also interesting to think about Isaiah. We have the Qumran scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls found in the Qumran caves. The scroll of Isaiah dating from before the time of Christ found in those caves. These words written before the time of Christ. For unto us, verse 6, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Look there, his government is continually increasing. Right? Day by day by day, the government of the Messiah, the government of the Davidic King, the government of the Lord Jesus Christ is continually increasing. People, day by day by day by day, turning from their sin and putting their faith and trust in Christ. Day by day by day, people being saved. Sometimes we, we think, you know, like we're in our study of Ezra, we see those Israelites coming out of captivity few in number. And to them maybe a cause for despair, a cause for discouragement. But there is a multitude of heaven which no man can number worshiping the Lamb. Here, day by day by day, it's like the mustard seed, right? Day by day, people are turning to the Lord. People turning from their sin, trusting Christ alone. And where his government increases and continues to increase, there's an increase of peace. As his government increases, peace with God increases. And of that increase, there will be no end. No end. Where are you today? Have you turned to the Lord? Multitudes are pressing into the kingdom, right? Violent men take it by force, turning from their sin, trusting Christ. Don't sit on your laurels. Turn from your sin, trust him. He reigns, it says, upon the throne of David. He has ordered it and established it. He has settled it with judgment and justice, and he reigns henceforth forever. From that time forward, even for forever. And he says, he ends verse there, Isaiah chapter 9, the Lord, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts. The zeal of the Lord of hosts, having overcome all opposition, the very gates of Hades, unable to stand against the pressing forward of this kingdom, he, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, he will perform this. You know, gates, we've talked about this before. Gates are a defensive mechanism. Gates are put in place to defend a stronghold. 
And the Bible says that the gates of Hades will not stand, will not be able to prevail against the spread of the Lord's kingdom, the spread of the church. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, Pilate, back in John chapter 19, Pilate simply wrote here what God has already written. (laughs) Pilate simply writes what God had beforehand written upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. What I have written, Pilate says, I have written. Really is God saying, what I have written, I have written. And no matter how much the Jews want it changed, no matter how much you in your own life might want that changed, what God has written, he has written. Absolute finality. There is no changing it. Now, how will you respond to that? How are we to respond to that? The rule and reign of the Lord Jesus Christ is established from forever and for forever, from eternity past into eternity future. And what has been written has been written. And here, that kingdom established in judgment and justice at the cross, the zeal of the Lord of hosts performing this. Turn from your, from your sin. <laughs> right? Follow Christ. Brothers and sisters, we're sojourners and pilgrims here. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're looking forward to that kingdom which is coming. <laughs> Follow Christ. Follow Christ. All of this, the title of the king, the scope of his kingdom, the implications of his kingship, all being affirmed here, at the cross by the writers of the Gospels, ultimately by the Holy Spirit, all being affirmed here by the Word of God. The truth of this, the veracity of this, the the fact of all these events that attend the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ and all of the theological implications of that being affirmed here by the Word of God. That's point three on your notes. All this is affirmed by the word. And as John's writing through the historical narrative, he gives us an example. One of many, we'll take a look at more next week. He gives us more, one here of many examples of how these events and the theological importance or the theological significance of those events, how all of that is affirmed by the word of God beforehand. Look at verse 23. Point three in your notes, it is affirmed. It is affirmed by the word. Verse 23, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said therefore among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it whose it shall be. That the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now remember here, the Lord Jesus Christ has been stripped. He hangs on the cross in nakedness. The purpose of this is to humiliate him, right? The shame they heap upon the Lord. The shame of nakedness was first experienced by the fall of man in the garden. And he, therefore, who became sin for us, he bears that shame now. He was stripped so that we could be robed in white robes, right? Now, it's interesting here, when we consider the import of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, to have our focus diverted to what happens here in John 19 with his clothes. And all four gospel writers mention this. All four gospel writers record this account of the soldiers casting lots for the Lord's clothing. And John's very specific here. Verses 23 and 24, it gives us a lot of detail. So I want us to think about these two verses in terms, one, of the action of the soldiers, the actions of the soldiers, and the aim of John. Ultimately, the aim of the Holy Spirit in recording this detail. Consider this with me. First, the actions of the soldiers. In verse 23, it was customary again. It was common 
to assign a detachment of four soldiers to each prisoner. So these four soldiers assigned to each prisoner would come under the command of a centurion. So maybe Josh Josh can help me with the math. We have three people crucified, four soldiers each person, 12 soldiers, one centurion. All right? All right. If you remember from Acts chapter 12, when Peter was arrested, Peter's arrested in Acts chapter 12, and in verse 4, he was placed under the guard of four soldiers. This was a common practice, right? So you have four soldiers around the cross of Christ, one centurion. Matthew Henry remarked here about the Lord's clothes. He said, the wages with which these soldiers paid themselves for crucifying Christ, referring to the, the clothes of the Lord Jesus Christ, those were their wages. They were willing to do it for his old clothes. And he says, nothing is to be done so bad, but there will be found men bad enough to do it for a trifle. So in verse 23, these soldiers then, when they had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart and also the tunic. Now, there would have been a long outer garment called a cloak. And then there would have been a long inner garment, inner garment worn next to the skin, uh, often sleeveless, made of leather or linen. It was called the tunic. Nothing special about the cloak. Nothing special about the tunic. Nothing special about the clothes. Nothing mystical here. Right? All kinds of wild, sort of fanciful, symbolic interpretations of the, the meaning of the tunic sewn in, from top to bottom in one piece. A lot said about the reluctance of the soldiers to divide it because that'd be like dividing the church. And this is obviously a symbol of the unity and the peace of the church. The tunic woven, and top, woven from top to bottom without any seams, without being split. Nothing mystical here going on with the clothes. They simply divided his clothes among themselves. The garment they took, they split it likely along the seams. To each soldier, they got a part. However, the tunic being seamless, it would have ruined the tunic for them to have divided it rendering the tunic useful to no one. And so they decided, have a little sport among themselves, they decided to cast lots for it instead. So in the second part of verse 23, it says the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said therefore amongst themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. So while the Lord hangs in agony upon the cross, Roman soldiers are entertaining themselves, and dividing the spoils among themselves at his feet. These are the actions of the soldiers. But next we see the aim of John, or the aim of the Holy Spirit, at the end of verse 24. At the end of verse 24, John records, so that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. Do you see? The scripture said it. Therefore, the soldiers did it. The aim of John, the purpose of John in recording this, in fact, the aim of the gospel writers, right? The aim of the Holy Spirit is once again to point us back to the word of God for us to understand these things happened exactly as God had intended for them to happen. All of this happens according to the scriptures. Now, imagine in the first century, if you were one of the disciples of Christ, disciples of Christ charged the mission of the church to evangelize the lost, to make disciples, go and make disciples, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. They're to go and they're to evangelize. They're to be witnesses for Christ. For the Jews of that day to witness to another Jew steeped in the Judaism of the day, it would have been important for that Jew to whom they were witnessing to see all of these truths revealed in the Word of God. In other words, Jesus Christ is not some upstart, Nazarene, despised usurper. Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. He is the promised Davidic King, and we can prove it to you from the Word of God. Jesus Christ is God the Son, God in the flesh, and we can prove it to you from the Scriptures. When we witness, when we evangelize, 
It's important to do that from the Word of God. Take them to the Bible. Take them to the text of Scripture. These things are prophesied. This is God's Word. These are God's intentions. These are God's decrees. And everything that is happening is happening exactly according to the will of God. All that is true of the will of God spoken in the past is true and is equally as true as all those things that are yet fulfilled in the future. If God has said it, it will most certainly come to pass. And we can consider those things even in our own Christian lives, in our own evangelism. Consider that all of those things yet to be fulfilled, all of those things yet future will most certainly come to pass. The evidence for that One of the evidences for that is the fact that everything that God has said in the past will most certainly, or did most certainly, come to pass. The aim of John in recording this is to point us back to the Word of God. The Word of God affirms the events of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a detail that might otherwise pass unnoticed considering the grave circumstances of the cross are these details related to the soldiers dividing his garments. But from what might be considered by some to be an insignificant or a passing detail, a minor detail, all the way from that to the ultimate occurrence of the cross itself, every circumstance, every action, every deed, every word, every unbeknowing or unwitting participant, everything that happens falls within the eternal plans and purposes of God to fulfill all his word. The therefore, if you look at verse 24, the therefore at the end of verse 24 could be translated this way. So this is what the soldiers did. Or indeed, the soldiers did these things, right? affirming scripture. These soldiers unwittingly do exactly what God said long ago that they would do. The passage that's being referenced here in the Old Testament is Psalm 22. And turn with me to Psalm 22. And let's take a look at this passage together. Psalm So it's interesting considering Psalm 22 as well, that Psalm 22, a fragment or a manuscript from Psalm 22 found in Qumran Cave 4, likely dating before Christ. Again, these words written by David, written by the psalmist, psalmist a thousand years before Christ, written a thousand years before Christ when crucifixion wasn't even heard of at the time. And the words of this psalm written and penned, looking forward to the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Does that sound familiar? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning. Mark's gospel records in Mark 15, verse 33. He says, now when the sixth hour had come, There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Lord says these words at the cross from Psalm 22, verse 1. Verse 2, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. In the night season, and am not silent, He's feeling distance here, feeling the separation, sensing the separation. But what is his response? Verse 3, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and they were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But verse 6, I am a worm and no man a reproach of men, despised by the people, Jesus Christ, that Nazarene. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And men are at best worms. 
Men are at best worms. We are worms. And yet he was made a worm and no man. He was charged as a blasphemer, charged as a Sabbath breaker, called a glutton, a wine bibber, a false prophet in league with the devil. Look at verse 7. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake their head. They wag their head, as Matthew says, right? Saying, verse 8, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 39, they wagged their heads at him in mocking scorn. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 41, the chief priests with the scribes and elders said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. It's in direct fulfillment of Psalm chapter 22, verse 8. Almost word for word. Verse 9. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth, from my mother's womb. You have been my God. In other words... From the time of his birth, right? From the time that Mary lays the baby in the manger, so to speak, until this point where the Lord of glory hangs in agony upon a Roman cross, all of that time, God was with him, never forsaking him. Be not far from me, verse 11, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. His disciples having abandoned him, His disciples fleeing in the garden. He treads the wine press now alone on the cross. What's true here of David is true of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is also true of you and I, isn't it? From the time of your birth, from the time that you were knit together in your mother's womb, God is God over you. He is near. He's not a God who is far off. And you can trust him when trouble is near. There is none other to help but God and God alone. Verse 12, many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. Judas, the Jews, right? The angry mob, Pilate, heartless soldiers, this wicked, godless, God-hating world. The wicked plot against him, and they snatch at him like a lion with his prey. Verse 14, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint, just a bag of bones. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. My strength dried up like a potsherd, like an old piece of clay, dried up pottery, broken pottery. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death, to the very brink of the grave. Dogs, verse 16, have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. A thousand years before Jesus was crucified, David writes of crucifixion when crucifixion didn't exist as a method of execution. Right here in verse 16, they pierced my hands, they pierced my feet. Verse 17, I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They, you notice the, the emphasis on humiliation, shame, on scorn. Again, by the way, this portion of Psalm 22 found in Qumran Cave 4. Psalm 22, written a thousand years before Christ. And now the oldest manuscript that we have of Psalm 22 likely before the time of Christ. Verse 18. Here it is again. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Exactly as it occurs in John chapter 19. You know, this fact, verse 18, the fact that they divide his garments, or for the tunic they cast lots, doesn't contribute much to our understanding of the suffering of Christ doesn't contribute much to the, our understanding of the shame that was heaped upon him at the cross. But what this fact contributes, because of Psalm 18, 
Because the word of God says so, what this fact contributes is profound, isn't it? Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We see it prophesied here in Scripture. Verse 19. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. That statement at the end of verse 21, a statement of triumph, right? a statement of victory. You have answered me. We have our answer from the Lord. It would be here in the psalm, so to speak, where the Lord would proclaim, it is finished. It is finished. That which had been prophesied, that which had been decreed, that the Son of God would come to the earth to suffer and die for sinners, that has been accomplished. And the psalm, as does our narrative in John chapter 19, the psalm ends in triumph. Look at verse 22. This brings to mind our remembrance of Hebrews chapter 2, right? Verse 22, I will declare your name to my brethren. He's not ashamed to call us brothers. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All you offspring of Joseph, off, offspring of Israel. Now think with me for a moment. Verses 22, 23. These terms, the assembly, descendants of Jacob, offspring of Israel, no longer here only applying to the Jews. Because of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the middle wall of separation has been torn down. The Jews and Gentiles now one by faith in Christ. One people of God. So when he says in the midst of the assembly, we know and understand that now. The, the fulfilling of that Jewish assembly in the New Testament is the church. The fulfillment of God's plans and purposes all come about in the church. Jew and Gentile together. No middle wall of separation. When he says descendants of Jacob, you are descendants of Jacob by faith in Christ if you turn from your sin and trust him. Amen? We are the spiritual offspring of Abraham. Here, the spiritual offspring of Israel. All this applies, finds its ultimate fulfillment in the church. The spiritual seed of Abraham by faith. Look at verse 24. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard, My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. When we gather together every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, the praise of him will be on his lips, will be on our lips. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. Verse 27. All the ends of the world, Jew and Gentile alike, shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. A note here, verse 27, the first you must remember and turn to the Lord. You're to remember. Remember the prodigal son. The prodigal son in the first country, first he comes to his senses and then he comes to his father. Right? He first remembers. He comes to his senses and then he comes to his father. Verse 27, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. Peoples of every tribe, tongue, and nation. Remember that you are made. I remember that you are not your own. Remember that you have a purpose to glorify God. Remember that you are made to worship Him. Remember that you are a sinner. I remember that you have offended Him with your sin, that you've turned from that purpose. From your first breath, you are at enmity with God. You're an enemy of God by your wicked works. Remember here that you are a lawbreaker. Remember that your days are numbered. Remember that sin leads to death. In verse 27, turn to the Lord. Right? Turn to the Lord. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. Why? 
that he might bring us to God. That he might bring us to God. Look at Psalm 22, verse 29. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. So in verse 29, rich, poor, old, young, strong, weak, up-and-comers, down-and-outers, <laughs> all will eat, it says, and worship all who go down under the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. Verse 30, a posterity shall serve him. A people, the apple of his eye, those whom he has called, those whom he has redeemed, a posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. That's interesting here. How will it be recounted? How will that posterity who serves him recount that to the next generation? It will be recounted of the Lord, verse 30, to the next generation. Verse 31, they will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, that he has done this. And verse 31, those who come, knowing these truths, right? This is our response to the gospel. When we consider John chapter 19 and what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for sinners, when we consider he is the king, he is the king and his kingdom is established in judgment and in justice, it has been affirmed by the word of God, even with such seemingly insignificant details as those soldiers casting lots for his clothing at the foot of the cross. What are we to then declare? They'll declare two things, verse 31. They'll declare that there is a righteousness. It's a righteousness not found in ourselves, but only in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is his righteousness that righteousness is the foundation of our hopes, right? It's the fountain of our justification, the fountain of our hopes. His righteousness. They'll declare his righteousness, and they'll declare at the end of verse 31 that he has done this. That the Lord Jesus Christ has done this. That the work of our redemption is finished at the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The work of our salvation is finished by Jesus Christ. He has done this. He's done it and not we ourselves. I witnessed to um, two Mormons on Saturday and the thrust of almost our entire conversation was their insistence upon works to be saved. We talked about the equation, right? Grace equals salvation. Not grace plus works. We are saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. If you put works on the wrong side of that equation, grace plus faith plus works equals salvation. You've got works righteousness. You go to hell when you die. It is His righteousness that we are to proclaim Secondly, we're, we're to proclaim that He has done it. The work of our redemption is finished by the Lord Jesus Christ, that He has done this. And we as people are to proclaim that. Right? If you've turned from your sin and you put your faith and trust in Christ, you are the posterity of God being spoken of here. You'll stand in the great assembly with the Lord Jesus Christ. We will praise the Lamb who is slain. Worship God and his posterity, verse 30, shall serve him. We are to, having understood these truths, having seen this affirmed by the word of God, having understood that the Lord Jesus Christ has finished this for us who have put their faith and trust in Christ, who have turned from their sin, we are then to serve him and declare that triumph. We are the posterity that should come and declare his righteousness to a people who are born. We're to declare that these, this has been done by the Lord Jesus Christ, that he has done it. That's our mission. Those are our marching orders, right? We are his posterity to declare his righteousness, that he has done this. All praise, honor, and glory to the one who has finished the work of our redemption. Amen? All right.
We'll look more at John 19 next week and wrap up this text looking at the accomplished work of Christ on the cross. For now, let's pray together silently and consider the text of Scripture. Consider what the Lord has done. Consider the affirmation the Lord has made of these glorious truths in His Word. Consider how we are to live and to respond to these truths, asking the Lord's help, asking the Lord's blessing. Now, as we consider this sermon and as we consider His Word to us, let us pray silently together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we pray now in consideration of these things that you would, by your spirit, lay the implications of these texts uh, to our heart. If there's anyone here, Lord, not saved, I pray they would see the truth, the fact of your kingdom. It has been established. And that is affirmed by your word beforehand so that we know it's our God who knows the future, who has written history. It's our God who has done this. I pray that my brothers and sisters, that along with me, that we would, Lord, understand the implications of these passages on our Christian lives that as your posterity, we would serve you. Looking, Lord, at the implications of your kingdom being established, that our citizenship is not here, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we are mere pilgrims, and aliens, and foreigners here. Here, Lord, to declare your righteousness, to declare among this wicked and perverse generation that you have done it. You have accomplished salvation, that it is finished, and that sinners must turn from their sin and trust Christ. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to these truths. Spirit of God, give us the strength, give us the understanding, the wisdom to pursue faithfulness to you in these things for your glory. To trust you by faith and look for with great hope. Mm-hmm great anticipation to the full consummation of all that the kingdom is, the end of all things, where you will finally conquer sin, put an end to sin, finish the transgressions, as Daniel says, and usher in full consummation of your kingdom. We look forward with great hope to that day. Lord Jesus Christ, come. We look forward to worshiping you and praising you unfettered by sin. Help us now, Lord, as we serve you, serve you faithfully. Strengthen us, Lord, to that end for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.